Hello and happy Thursday. Welcome to this week's episode of Desire Made Real, a Discovery of Witches podcast. But before we get started, we wanted to make a quick announcement. You may remember that we have decided to do some live tweets of a few of the episodes. So we will be doing episode six this Sunday, February 17th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Keep an eye on our Twitter account on Sunday. We will post a link to a rabbit room where we will be streaming it for you to watch along with us. So enjoy the rest of your week and hopefully we'll see you Sunday. Welcome to Desire Made Real, a Discovery of Witches podcast where we recap every episode of the television show spoiler free. I'm one of your hosts, Mandy Kay, and when I'm not talking about Matthew and Diana, I'm talking about movies on my other podcast, Pop Culturally Deprived. And I'm Caitlin, and when I'm not talking about A Discovery of Witches, I'm podcasting about Lord of the Rings on So You Want to Read Tolkien. Each week, we'll recap the episode spoiler-free, and we'll also be joined by our friend Dr. Anya, an evolutionary biologist, who will talk about the science of the show. We'll also include a segment at the end to discuss the books, how well the adaptation works, and we will likely dive in to some spoilers here. But don't worry, we'll give you plenty of warning before we get there. Episode 5 was directed by Alice Troughton and written by Charlene James. And from here until the end of the season, all the episodes are written and directed by women. Yay! So nice to see women in a writer's room. It is. The other show I've become, like, obsessed with this year is All Women in the Writer's Room, so I guess that's my new thing. What show is that? Um, the Anne with an E series. Oh, I am a Megan Follows snob, and so I have not given that one a chance yet. I enjoy any good interpretation of that story. Okay. I'll give it a shot one day. But it's having very, all, all Women in the Writer's Room is definitely a, an incentive. Yeah. All right. Well, we begin episode five with Diana in that amazing bathtub again. Do. I mean, technically, I think we begin with Matthew driving down the road while he gives his monologue, but it's boring. He's just driving. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. And I mean, he the looks the same good while monologue he's... that we've yeah. gotten in all of the episodes. He looks good while he's driving, but I don't think there's a scene where he doesn't look good. Except when he's got his t shirt tucked into his pants. Oh, right. <laughs> Let's not forget about that. Let's not forget about that. (laughs) But yes, she's in that amazing bathtub with two century-old vampires staring at her in the bathtub. That would make me very self-conscious. Yeah. Why does she take a bath with the door open? It's not. It's not really said here, but I don't. I just assumed they put her in there, and that I don't know. They were dealing with all of the water. I I think I'm kind of combining how it worked in the book with how it worked in the show. And assuming that that bath had something to do with dealing mm. with that. Okay, that's that's fair. Um, it's just there was definitely a very noticeable moment when Diana realizes there's two people staring at her naked. And so she kind of like hunches over yeah. and, and turns away. Yeah. It was very uncomfortable. I didn't enjoy it. No. But I did enjoy the idea of having that bathtub in my house. Yes. Always and forever. Yes. Us in that bathtub is our new OTP. Yes. Just not us at the same time. Yeah, you know. Well, obviously. I just meant I didn't want to choose like one of us over the other. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Moving on back to Oxford. <laughs> yep. Um, so Matthew pulls up in front of the, the old lodge and Miriam and Marcus meet him there. And Miriam is once again dressed amazingly with an amazing coat. Looks amazing, is amazing. I love her. I can second that. And then we we cut to the lab quickly, which, just because I was curious, I looked up the village that the lodge is in, which is like in a little town called Woodstock, which is eight miles or so outside of Oxford. Hmm. So why would he have gone there? But whatever. Yeah, I would have expected him to go straight to the lab. So it was strange that they had that little interstitial cut there. Yeah. But then they do go straight to the lab and Miriam brings up that, you know, they've been, you know, nobody's bothered them until now. And this is all Matthew's fault. And she can tell he's mating with Diana because she's mated before. 
And this is like the first really and only look we get into Miriam's past. Oh, you're right. And it's said in not a way that's meant to tell us anything about Miriam, but in a way to kind of condemn Matthew for doing this thing. Yeah. We don't learn what's happened to her mate, what what's going on. Mm-hmm. We just, it's focused on her blaming Matthew for mating with Diana. And Matthew just kind of brushes her off. And then Matthew recognizes the scent of the person who broke into the lab after he has mm-hmm. verified that nothing has been stolen and he leaves and marcus well miriam immediately orders marcus to call baldwin and i i I like this scene because it does show that the family is trying to work together to sort of solve this but also baldwin is like no if he breaks the rules he pays the price Mm -hmm. not gonna help matthew out anymore yeah, I like the, the the thing that he said to, to Marcus on the phone was Matthew never destroys only himself. And so Baldwin is trying to put the family first and not Matthew first. Yeah. Which I, I think is interesting. But I, I'm struggling with both what Miriam did here and Baldwin's reaction to it. Because part of me feels like Miriam is being a tattletale. I don't think book Miriam would ever have done that. Be, especially since we know a lot more about why mm-hmm. Miriam sticks around with Matthew mm-hmm. th- in the book than we do in the show. Yeah, when I think about it, the way she's been presented in the show, I I see her her loyalty to Matthew is very much in the same vein as Isabeau's. Like, both Isabeau and Miriam are very firmly against this thing that Matthew is doing because they love Matthew. Right. But it doesn't always immediately come across that way especially when miriam as soon as matthew leaves miriam's like okay we have to call baldwin like we have to do something here yeah and it's just frustrating a little bit i think it is but i do also like i i like baldwin and i like seeing his relationship with matthew Mm -hmm. but i even i more than anything like i can see miriam kind of being like call baldwin i can't see marcus being the one who actually does it and is like Look, they're mating, it's weird, blah, 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 what should we do? I don't think Marcus, like, I, I don't see Marcus having that type of relationship with Baldwin. Oh, no. He definitely wouldn't have called if Miriam hadn't said to. So, that's a bit weird. But I do like how they're setting up Baldwin to be a little bit more sympathetic than he was in the show. Uh, in the book? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely against Baldwin, especially at this point. Mm-hmm. I mean, given the information that he has at this point, he really is just trying to do what's best for his species and for his family. Right. And I cannot fault him for that. I just fault him for his arrogance a little bit. Yeah, that's fair. And then we get to go hunting again. This yeah. Is slightly different than the last time we went hunting with Matthew. Just slightly. I like the way they set it up. We've got the juxtaposition of Matthew hunting Jillian because Mm -hmm. Jillian is the scent that he picked up when he was in the lab for who broke into his lab and Isabeau hunting the fox in front of Diana. Yeah. It's, I don't know, it's, it's so weird. And like the camera angles are the same as they cut back and forth between the two. There's a lot of circling motion Mm -hmm. to kind of show the stalking that they're doing of their prey yep um i thought it was beautifully done i liked it a lot also i did think i think it's a little bit ridiculous when you see isabeau hunting a fox and like it's supposed to be dangerous i don't know it just doesn't come across as threatening yeah i i didn't it didn't come across as threatening like her prey per se Mm -hmm. Her behavior did because she was very clearly predatory. Yeah, and that's true. It didn't hit that moment of ridiculousness until they showed us Isabeau sitting there eating the entrails of the fox. <laughs> like she didn't just drink the blood of this fox; she was literally snacking on its intestines. <laughs> I actually really enjoyed that. I can't really pinpoint why, but I did. I liked it a lot. I, I do think it's really impressive at how graceful Lindsay Duncan looked doing it. And, yeah. and it's really weird that I'm using the word graceful to describe eating intestines. I don't think, I, I like to think she wasn't like chewing on them so much as 
like sucking the blood out of them. That's grosser, actually. Oh, no, she was full on chewing. Like she was talking with her mouth full. I guess. <laughs> it was just it was weird. Um, but yeah, we we did see when when Matthew bites Jillian again, we get to see that blood has some sort of or it gives some sort of psychic link to mm-hmm. the vampire. Um, he sees the memories that she has of breaking into the lab. So he kind of got to see what she was doing and what she was looking for. Yes. Which was interesting. I hated Jillian in this scene. Oh, absolutely. I'm glad Matthew bit her. Well, okay. So can we talk for a second about how monumentally stupid Jillian was for breaking into Matthew's lab? What did she think was going to happen? I don't know. I think, like, Peter Knox has manipulated her a lot. And I guess she just wants to impress him. But did she think they wouldn't be able to smell her and know that it was her? It's possible she doesn't know anything about how vampires work. And I'm not trying to defend her. I'm just saying, like, it's possible she didn't do her research, that she was actually just stupid about this beginning to end. Okay, that's fair. I I will give you that. Okay. Although it did seem like she took initiative on her own because Peter Knox didn't know about it. He found out about it when when the guy was telling him. I don't know what that guy's name was later on. We get his name next episode. I forget what it is, though. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it's just it, it's weird all the way around. And um, I super, super thought that he killed her. I mean, she looked dead. I, is she what did I mean. dead. She yeah. looked super dead. I really thought that as he walked away she was dead would you have been forgiving like would you have still been cool with matthew as the hero of the show if he had killed her i don't know probably because i'm fickle right and that means matthew can do whatever he wants and i'm still gonna like him probably i really don't know though yeah i don't know either if he killed peter knox i'm all for it but i guess jillian is kind of a I don't want to say innocent bystander, but she's definitely, it's not all her fault because Peter Knox has put her in this position with his manipulation. I don't know. I'm just really glad he didn't kill her. I'm glad too. We switch to the congregation and they're talking about how Matthew's attacked a witch and Peter tries to play it off like he just randomly played, uh, picked someone. But again, we see because they, because Marcus spoke to Baldwin, He knows that Jillian broke into the lab. And while the vampires seem okay with this, some of the witches and and Agatha in particular doesn't seem like that is justification for attacking a witch. I don't know. I kind of think it is. I think I think in their world it is. Yeah, right. That's what I mean. Um, So later in this episode, Baldwin refuses to let anybody else from the congregation on his property. So vampire property is clearly has some sort of sanctity. Mm -hmm. And so if they're going to let Baldwin make that call, then they have to be okay with Matthew feeling the same way about his own lab. Yeah. And I also feel like uh, Knox plays off that he doesn't know why Jillian would have done this when he specifically requested the Oxford witches, you know, look into Matthew. Mm -hmm. And I just hate him so much. Oh, I hate him for sure. And then we go back to France. And Diana is doing her her weekly check-in with the ants. And I really like this conversation because everybody seems to keep their cool during it. Yeah. Which is not generally the case where Diana and Sarah are involved. Yeah, it almost feels like Sarah's response to Diana is slightly out of character. When Diana says something like, I'm sorry, I haven't called and updated you on anything. And Sarah's like, oh, well, that's okay. Tell us now. I'm like, yeah, the Sarah me- from last episode would be flipping her shit. I like this idea that I have in my head of M like, talking her down as the phone was ringing. Like, it's okay. She's calling us now. She's fine. We're good. Oh, okay. I do like that visual. <laughs> that's yeah. good. Okay. And then, once again, we see M being, like, the voice of reason during all this, mm-hmm. um, when Diane is explaining that she's in love with Matthew and screw the covenant and all that. And Emma's like, well, how does Matthew feel? And Diane's like, well, he hasn't said. But I know he loves me. Yeah. Yeah. So did you pick up on the, it was a kind of a throwaway, blah, it was kind of a throwaway line, 
But Diana tried to draw a connection between her love of Matthew and Sarah and M's relationship. I did pick up on that. I don't think I'd like it. Yeah, no, I don't like it at all. And yeah, I, I almost wish that Sarah or M had responded to it. As soon as Diana said, I thought you two would understand. I feel like they should have called her on that. Yeah, I agree. They should have called her on it right away. But then we get to, well, oh, this scene, I was going to say the best scene in this episode, but a lot of good things happen in this episode. But one of my favorites, Hamish and Matthew, best bros forever. Yeah, Hamish. Hamish is awesome. He is. And I like in this scene, we get the feel from the friendship that we wanted last time. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Yeah, this scene doesn't end with Hamish being all judgy like it did in yeah. the last one. And so this is just full on supportive friendship. And it's so wonderful to see between two men. It is. Absolutely. I, I, this, I think, have we talked about this before? I don't remember. But how this sh show is really good at showing caring relationships between men. And I really like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we've touched on it before because of Marcus. Okay. Yeah, like Marcus and James and Marcus and Matthew. But I think this is probably the best scene that we've gotten so far. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do love like Hamish says some really smart things. But my favorite exchange in this conversation is when he's like, do you love her? And Matthew just sort of looks at him and he just says, Oh, Christ, Matthew. <laughs> and then Matthew goes, I know, I know. <laughs> it just shows such a good camaraderie between them. Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, we do also learn a little bit more about the importance of Matthew and the Declaremonts in this scene. It's, again, it, it can be so easily glossed over. I love the way they just throw little things in. But, you know, Matthew says that he kind of hoped that they would ignore this thousand-year-old rule. And Hamish is like, well, they kind of do, you know. I'm with humans all the time. And Matthew says, but you're not a threat to the congregation, a vampire and a witch. Specifically, me, Matthew, a de Claremont, is a threat. And so you get this really, this, this idea that Matthew is somehow this big fucking deal. And it's such a terrible thing for him to be breaking a congregation rule and maybe trying to overpower the congregation. Maybe that's what the congregation's afraid of at this point. But I love how you can kind of get all of the potential of where the future is going just from this one little line that Matthew says. Yeah. Yeah. They, they're really good at these throwaway or like quote unquote throwaway lines that hint to how the declaremonts are a big fucking deal. Yeah. They, I mean, they just give us tidbits, little nuggets. And I think that's great because I, I know we've talked about before. I think it was particularly in episode two or three where it was just so exposition heavy. And now they've kind of found their rhythm of yeah. showing us things and then just giving us little pieces as we go. Yeah. It's great. I also enjoy it. And then we are back in France again. And Isabeau has decided to educate Diana about Matthew's past. Oh, Isabeau. <laughs> and so she... She talks about how Matthew was born in this village as a human, and his father was a carpenter, I think? A stone dude? Stone cutter. Stone dude. <laughs> a, sto a stoner. <laughs> he was a stone cutter. There we go. And helped build this church that she shows, which is so incredibly not a 1,500-year-old church. Shh, it's the magic of television. The it, Okay, Sure. Sure. I do agree with you, though. I mean, because if you look at the shots that they do of Sator from far away, mm -hmm. um, it the outside of it does actually look like it's a little bit falling into ruin. Yeah. And the outside of this church looked pristine. It looked pristine and just like the style of it. Like they wouldn't have made that 1500 years ago. It was just wrong. And I am in no way a historian or anybody who would know this. But even I can tell that like... <laughs> There's a tower. How would, why? No, no. Anyways, it's fine. Then they go into the church and Isabeau talks about Planca and Lucas, uh, Matthew's human wife and their son. Yeah. And I hate everything about this conversation. 
I do too. I, my notes are literally just shut up, Isabeau. Yeah. I hate like, that I feel that way about Isabeau in this scene because I love her, but she just needs to back off. I will. This is done very differently than it is in the book, so I will say that. They're, I don't know, they decided to do something different in the show. But her implication, what she says to Diana, like, in 1500 years, Matthew has never mated, and she doesn't think he ever will, because no woman can give him a child, Mm -hmm. now that he's a vampire. And I hate this implication that his, his, you know, his previous relationship with Blanca and his current relationship with Diana is somehow dependent on their ability to have a child. Because I have a feeling that Blanca was probably a worthy human being of love without having children, and so is Diana. And right. relationships do not rely on children. Absolutely agree. I, I hate that so much. And uh, Yeah, everything yeah. that Isabeau says in the scene is designed specifically to hurt Diana. I mean, she could have given Diana all of this information about Matthew's past in a much different way, but she did it in a way to drive Diana away. I mean, we we, she's already tried to do that with the hunting scene and Diana's response to that. We didn't even talk about that. But Diana's response was, you don't scare me. Can we go home now? Which was fantastic. And so Isabeau is like trying to step up her game to get rid of her. And it just drives me crazy. And it's sort of couched in this, like, oh, I'm just trying to help you. And, like, we're getting closer. Because when they walk out of the church, they're both kind of, like, smiling and having a nice conversation. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, what? No, that was that was bullshit, Isabel. Right. I also don't really like, I don't really know where else we would talk about this, but Diana never asks Matthew about Blanca and Lucas in the show. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of sad they never have a conversation about that. That could come up later. I guess. There's still time. I guess. <laughs> this is also where we do get the story of how Isabeau turned Matthew or why Isabeau turned Matthew. Yeah. Um, he, after Blanca and Lucas died, he fell from the tower that he was building in the church mm-hmm. and could have been he fell, could have been he jumped Isabeau doesn't really know. I think the way that she says it kind of indicates that she thinks he jumped. So she decided to sire him, to turn him so that he would live. And I think it's really interesting here. She uses the word rage to describe Matthew after he was turned. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, Diana's response to that is, you know, I can't imagine Matthew being like that. And that's kind of how I feel. This is the first hint that we've had in this particular context that there's more to Matthew than the control that we see. But it's the second time in this episode that somebody has talked about Matthew in a way that's not quite so good, because we had Baldwin before saying Matthew never destroys just himself. Right. So you have that, and then that's followed with Isabeau talking about rage, and I I think that's an interesting thread for us to follow throughout the rest of the series, next season, et cetera. And she mentions that he used to basically just disappear, Mm -hmm. and she had no idea what he was up to during that time. Right. But it sounds like Philippe did. Yes. Oh, uh, that's another thing that I think they're doing well. All these little hints that Philippe and Matthew were really close. Mm Mm-hmm. Except for that one stepfather line from last episode. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Whatever. Yeah. And then, as your notes so eloquently say, we go back to Peter fucking Knox and mm-hmm. the congregation. <laughs> My note here is Peter Knox is smarmy, Baldwin is smug, Gerber is arrogant, and Agatha is suspicious. I think that's true of every congregation scene. I think so. Um, but they all had lines, like one right after the other here, and it just kind of struck me as very, like, you could see each personality so clearly yeah. as, as they're trying to figure out how to get Diana away from Matthew and off of Sator. And this is where Baldwin, Baldwin, you know, steps up and says, I am the head of the family and that is my property and nobody but me is going there. Yeah. I'd be really interested in seeing Deborah Harkness write a Baldwin-centric book. Just because I want to know more about how his brain works. Mm -hmm. I'd be okay with that. Now that I have the whole story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, at this point in the book, I hated Baldwin. Well, at this point in the book, we didn't know Baldwin. But, (laughs) (laughs) like, 
Right. There's yeah. there's a very clear point in like the third book where I was like, maybe Baldwin's okay. Yeah. But show Baldwin, I really like. Yeah. Yep. Um. So we cut from Baldwin refusing to let anybody on his property to Satu. Satu sitting there with this very clear thinking look on her face. You can just see the wheel spinning. And then we cut to her having a conversation with Peter Knox um, outside of the congregation chamber. And she says she wants to find a way to look inside Diana to find out how she's hiding her power. And this is something that even Peter Knox is against, which floors me. You know, this is the man who brought a human to her to sacrifice so that she could prove that she's worthy of being on the congregation. He doesn't care that Jillian was attacked by Matthew. And he is even saying, no, we can't do that. He says that it's an opening spell and that he can never put a living witch through that. And that just sounds so scary. Yeah. And it it really shows Satu's obsession and how she even is then like, we could work with the vampires. And Peter's like, no, 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 no. That's a bad idea. Yeah, I think in this moment, Satu gets a little scarier than than Peter. Up until yeah. now, she's had her moments of being like super creepy as fuck, but Peter has kind of kept her under his thumb. You know, we've seen him subdue her physically slash magically. And so you kind of always had the sense that Satu is more like his guard dog. Really? Yeah. And here, she is definitely up to something. And it's scary. I I like Satu as a character. Like, I don't like her as a person, if mm-hmm. that makes any sense. Oh, absolutely. Like friends, obviously. Mm-hmm. But I do like how this is sort of showing her going on her own journey and making her own decisions and realizing that Peter maybe got her onto the congregation, but fuck Peter. Right. You know, she has questions. She's going to get her answers. Yeah. And I do like that as, as like a, a villain arc. Yeah, definitely. But Not at all we, saying she's a good person. Sorry. <laughs> no, she's definitely not a good person, but she's a good, interesting character. Yes. Yeah, and so then we cut to a completely different tonal scene with uh, demons at dinner. Mm-hmm. Um, Nat has had the online forum that we heard him talk about before that the congregation is forcing him to shut down, but it has caused several of them to meet in person. And they are really talking about how they can kind of get around the congregation's rules at this point. Mm -hmm. But we don't get to spend a lot of time there, which I I really wish that we did. But we cut to Sophie, who comes in late, and she has had another vision of Agatha and the witch. She doesn't know Diana's name at this point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, she does. Yeah, she doesn't know Diana's name at this point, and so she's basically begging Nat to get his mom. Like they need to tell her the truth about who Sophie is, whatever that means. Yeah, I think this is the first that we see that they're kind of hiding something. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's it. We don't get any answers. We're just they're hiding something. Yeah, we're we're building because previously it's it's been all about Sophie and the alchemy and the statue. And mm-hmm. Nat doing this thing that's potentially against the congregation. And so both of those have their own sort of threads of mystery. But now we're getting a much deeper secret that has to do with Sophie yeah. as a person. And it's so big that her husband's mother doesn't even know what And they specifically say that, they're, that, you know, Agatha's on the congregation, so we can't tell her. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. It sounds like it's a big secret. And then we're back with Diana, who's sitting at Matthew's desk that he could have used instead of Philippe's office, whatever. It's fine. And she starts snooping around, which I'm honestly surprised she's restrained herself for so long. Right? Because who wouldn't snoop in that kind of Especially a historian. Um, Exactly. When she finds a box that holds a seal that says the Knights of Lazarus of Bethany on it. And has Matthew's initials, basically. And it, I th- I like this because we get a look into, or this is our first look into, who Matthew was when Philippe was head of the family. Because you get the feeling that Baldwin kind of just ignores Matthew most of the time. And Matthew's like, great, mm-hmm. I'm a science nerd now. And, you know, just doing his own thing. But 
you know, in the past he's been a knight. And I, I, I like seeing that side of him. I yeah. hope we get to see more because, I mean, that's at this point, that's literally all we know is that he was a knight of Lazarus of Bethany, whatever that is. Yeah, I guess we don't really have any answers about that. No, uh, it'll be a couple, yeah. an episode or two before we hear more about that. Two episodes, I think. Yeah. But I do, I, I guess I guess it's just another look into Matthew's past that we're seeing in this episode and getting a fuller picture of who he's been over the centuries. Mm-hmm. And And then we switch back to Matthew with a strand of hair in his hand. Yeah. I'm sorry. I think this is creepy. He has a single strand of Diana's hair, and he is sniffing I don't it. know why, but it doesn't bother me. <laughs> like, I feel like I would be less bothered if it was, like, a full lock of hair, you know? Like, like a <laughs> clump of hair that, that had been cut. Not, like, from her scalp, but you know what I mean. Like, that would be less creepy than just a single strand that he's, like, inhaling up in his nose i don't know i didn't like see it. i definitely weird. would have found it more creepy if he had like cut off some of her hair and was keeping it with him <laughs> maybe maybe that i don't know calls her and she just like picks up the phone and sighs and doesn't say hello that bothers me see that didn't bother me because i totally feel her frustration I guess I just it's so ingrained in me to make some sort of a noise when you pick up a phone that not doing anything. I'm just like, what, what, what? It feels incomplete. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I pr- if I had been Matthew, I probably would have been like, yeah, exactly. Hello. Is anybody there? Like, I wouldn't have just started talking. Um, and I will say this is one of the scenes where we see Matthew's controlling side because... Diana, oh, what does she ask? She says something about the lab or Oxford, and he says, I don't want you to worry about that. She asks if it was with Oh, right, yes. And he says, yeah, it's like, I don't want you to worry about that right now. And like, we're all just thinking, oh my God, you just attacked Jillian, dude. Yeah, so that's not great. But the phone call ends pretty quickly because they obviously don't have much to say to each other before resolving everything. Because they so clearly both want to say, I love you, but neither of them will say it at this point. And it's just so awkward and uncomfortable. So they end the call and Matthew decides to do some science. And let's cut to Anya here and see how much of a scientist Matthew really is. I wanted to talk a little bit about the word mating uh, that they use a lot. And uh, so to me, this is a very scientific word that also happens to have connotations in mainstream culture and in the show they have the scientists use it in a way that is really only invoking the non-scientific meanings and completely ignoring the scientific meanings um in a way that like i found kind of annoying i'm sure it probably didn't bother anyone else it was one of the parts in the book that drove me the most bonkers so basically scientifically speaking vampires don't mate um because they don't reproduce sexually they're essentially an asexually reproducing parasite that sort of lives in the human host body. Um, And you don't need two vampires to make a new vampire. It only takes one. And so using the word mating to mean what in biology we would call actually pair bonding um, really kind of rubbed me the wrong way. So pair bonding is the word that we use for, you know, two organisms that, you know, form a strong social bond and often, like, raise offspring together, or in humans, you know, have, Mm -hmm. like, a romantic bonding together, and then versus mating is, you know, the actual act of physically having sex. Um, And it's an important distinction to make in biology, because in most species, those actually aren't the same thing. And so so this has really best been studied in bird species, uh, where over 90% of birds are thought to be socially monogamous, where they have these really strong pair bonds, where they, um, you know, you just pick one other individual and you're socially associated with them um, and, like, have a nest and all of that. But 75% of species also have extra pair fertilizations, is what it's called, basically cheating on your boo. Um, (laughs) In in non-scientific 
uh, terms where basically, you know, we can test the paternity of the mom, the dad, and the offspring. And a lot of times it turns out that the dad that raises the offspring and is pair bonded to the mom is not actually genetically the father. And so I really just, I think Matthew and Miriam should know better. (laughs) And I don't think they would casually use the word mating to describe what he's doing with Diana because it has nothing to do with reproduction. It's basically just, you know, a a romantic bond, but they're not going to have a baby. And I don't think he has plans on turning her. So yeah, like to me, when I hear Miriam say like, oh, he's mating with her, I see the signs. I think, oh no, is he going to turn her? But I don't think that's what Miriam means at all. Do you think they chose to use the word mate because of the more mainstream common usage of the word like it's recognizable to the general public as something like soulmates and like you're saying pair bonding is pair bonding is not something that we would say in a non-scientific context yeah. so do you think it was just because it's familiar to the audience at large probably but i guess i don't know i feel like if you watch enough discovery channel or like nature documentaries you're kind of used to like the lions are mating on the savannah you know like it's not I mean, but I, I think you are right. I, I, it's hard to think of a, a better word. I mean, you could say, like, he's getting romantically involved with her or, like, starting a relationship. I do actually have, like, an in-world explanation that works for me in that it is just a poor translation. What do you mean? Meaning that it probably wasn't originally an English term since vampires are so old and this phenomenon definitely existed pre-English language. That's true. Yeah, because English is only a few hundred years old and Matthew's, you know, 10,005 or whatever. (laughs) He's 1,500. Yeah, I'm I'm a professional mathematician, don't worry. (laughs) Isabeau and Philippe were mated and they are thousands of years I old see. right so i always assumed it was just uh like they chose a word in english that made sense but didn't really make like i don't think that they're it wasn't the original term i see and because miriam and matthew are both scientists they're but they're also both vampires so when they use that term they're not using it in that scientific context they're using it in their yeah. vampire context yeah that that totally makes sense and thank you for fixing that for me <laughs> That's how I think of it. Linguistic problem, not yeah. scientific problem. I actually really like that explanation because we do have a habit in English of paring down ideas into these tiny, tiny words that just remove all context. It does bring up another question, though, which, you know, since I'm a scientist and this show is wants me to think about it in an evolutionary context... I wonder, like, why vampires even have the urge to have sex since they can't reproduce. And, and you know, obviously a lot of their human urges change once they turn into a vampire um, and get taken over. So, yeah, like, my headcanon that I use is basically just that vampires use sex to attract human victims. And so um, they're having a sex drive helps them get food more easily. And so that's sort of why evolution has favored them keeping their sex drive after they get turned and they really shouldn't have one anymore in terms of reproduction. And that also works for the metaphor that we were talking about in a previous episode. Yeah, yeah. that vampirism itself is basically just like a metaphor for sexual Mm -hmm. desire. Yeah, I think actually that's supported by... So we've seen two scenes in the show so far of a vampire trying to feed slash sire on another person. One was Marcus trying to save his friend. So obviously that's not sexy and it's not really related to feeding. But then we see Juliet with her Matthew stand in and she definitely uses Mm -hmm. sex to attract him. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like vampires are super strong and super fast, so they don't like necessarily need sex to get a victim if they want to just go with brute force but then if they go with brute force it's like more public and out in the open and they're more likely to you know incite mob violence or whatever um so like 
using sex appeal to get somebody in a dark alley or something, you know? It seems like that could be pretty useful. Which is exactly yeah. what happened with yeah. Juliet. Plus, I mean, vampires are just sexy, sexy, broody, sexy. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so what did you guys think of the science scene? Because um, there was, like, a fun montage with music, and I thought it was, like, pretty well done visually. I or I assume we'll talk about the visuals and the musicals a little outside of this, but I, it's one of my favorite scenes in the series because it's it is just very beautiful. Yeah, and and again, like a lot of what they were showing didn't really make sense scientifically, but I didn't care because I thought you know they were clearly going for like what worked really well visually. I had a feeling it didn't make any <laughs> sense, so thank you for confirming that for me. Yeah, so basically most. DNA and like genetic work is all done in single use plastics for two main reasons. Like, first, uh, you want to keep things really clean uh, of contamination, and you can't you can't really just sterilize things because even if you kill bacteria, their DNA is still there. You need them to be like completely free of all organisms, and so that's why you don't really use glassware like the big glass beaker that they showed. You, everything is like little tiny plastic tubes. Um, And then the other reason is just because almost all DNA work is in really tiny volumes of liquid. Like we're talking less, like a mill or less. And so diluting the blood into a giant beaker of fluid would definitely defeat the purpose that way. That's the whole point of using like those tiny little micro pipetters. And then the other thing is that, so their scene shows Matthew Um, loading the blue dye into a a gel and so those gels are are often used to look at dna segments where you are looking for a specific segment but not for the sort of like whole genome wide sequencing stuff uh that you do when you're looking for markers Mm -hmm. so yeah the the kind of work that it sounds like their lab is doing would be done on a sequencing machine, um, which is pretty boring. It just looks like a big gray box, but it's a big gray box that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> and because they're so expensive, they mostly are done in what are called like big core facilities, where basically an individual lab couldn't afford one of these machines. They send in their samples and then get them sequenced at this facility, and then the facility sends you your data back, and then you analyze it back in your own lab. Right. Also, his gel loading technique is so sloppy. As someone who spent a lot of time in undergrad loading gels, I was just like, Matthew needs to get a steadier hand. Which you think would be the last problem he has. Yeah. (laughs) And then the final thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, when Miriam says that the program originally didn't recognize her markers, I guess because the data was done on historical witches and... She said, you know, like, there's been mutations since then. Um, But then they were able to look closer and find out that she has every genetic marker that they've ever seen in a witch. Mm -hmm. So for me, that is a bit confusing because theoretically, in order for her to have those markers, then her parents also would have had to have those markers unless she's having, like, weird spontaneous mutations, which would probably also cause lots of problems because most mutations are bad like a mutation is usually a random change and so a random change is more likely to mess something up than to make something better but you know i guess we'll you can just hand wave that as like they're magical mutations right because they're witches so maybe their mutations don't follow the same rules as as human mutations and so based on the fact that diana has all of these markers for every witch power ever known This basically tells them that the species decline that they thought was happening is actually maybe not happening, at least for Diana. And so I think it's really interesting to see, like, how unique is this for Diana? Or are there going to be other things happening with witches as well? But for me, the term species decline doesn't really make sense apply to witches the way it does apply to vampires, right? Because if vampires are failing to sire successfully, then they will eventually die out. And so that makes sense as like a species decline. But witches losing their powers, that doesn't mean they're 
literally disappearing, right? Because they can still reproduce and have offspring. Um, they're just, you know, their traits are changing. But evolutionary change isn't the same thing as ending a lineage, which is basically, you know, what's happening with the vampires. The vampire lineage is ending, but the witch lineage isn't ending. So I read this in your notes and it, it, it brought up a really interesting philosophical question for me. What is it that makes a witch a witch? Is a witch without her power still a witch or is that witch then considered a human? Yeah, Mandy, that is a great question. And you really hit the nail on the head with that. And that's like a lot of my questions with this text come from from that. It goes back to the question of like, okay, well, what is a species? And so we talked about it a little bit before, but scientifically, a species is a, a group of organisms that all come from a, a somewhat recent common ancestor and are distinct either genetically or physically from other lineages that come from even older common ancestors. And so it's a little bit of a, a wibbly-wobbly line. So, so for sexually reproducing organisms, we usually use the ability to interbreed and reproduce as a, a key measure of species, species separation and for like what makes species distinct from each other. But for asexually reproducing things like bacteria and viruses, like people usually just pick a, a arbitrary level of DNA differences to make them different species. Thinking about how that might apply to humans and witches, if witches are interbreeding with humans, then I wouldn't necessarily say that those are different species. I would say that witches is just a classification of humans who happen to have this extra trait of different powers. But to me, I don't know, it doesn't really make sense to think of witches as a species. And then the same would go for demons, since we've already learned that demons can be born from humans. Exactly. And so, yeah, that's like... <laughs> Part of the reason why I was so interested in, in being on this podcast and talking about it is because I'm, I'm like so fascinated by the book and the TV show because it seems like it's really trying to do something interesting with ideas of evolution and DNA and species and like tackle them in a really interesting way, but I'm not sure if it knows what it's doing. <laughs> and yeah, so I guess, you know, since I haven't read the second and third book, we'll have to, to wait and see. But I do, I do love that they're at least trying to uh, to incorporate science into the sort of monster fiction genre. Yeah, I think there is definitely a level of mystical in this. I mean, even mm -hmm. talking about mating, I, I think a, a piece of, of the mating is like a psychic link somehow or some sort of mental Ooh. drive. It, it feels mystical. And, and so there's this mystical layer underneath everything but they're trying so hard to keep the science at the forefront and i find that fascinating yeah. because we just don't get that very often when we are telling vampire and witch stories yeah and honestly like in the same way that i feel like this series is in so many ways a reaction to twilight like the series makes me want to try and write some like vampire witch fiction that has like an actual consistent biological underpinning you know like if vampires are parasites then like let's make them legit parasites i support this idea yeah i think i've never heard vampires described as an asexually rep reproducing parasite and i think that's the most amazing thing ever i mean it's so true though like at least from a from an evolutionary perspective because that's that's how they do it i'd be interested if that would ever get published because like vampire fiction gets published because it's sexy <laughs> i think you can make vampire science sexy we'll we'll workshop it that was okay. our tagline okay. for the episode i think we can make vampire science sexy there <laughs> yes. we go we got it <laughs> yeah and and going back to this idea of like an evolutionary perspective on vampires assuming that the the test for markers that Miriam did for in Marcus's DNA last episode, it really matters whether she was looking at his human DNA or what we're assuming is his vampire DNA. Because if um, the vampire fitness just depends on the vampire DNA, 
then that's like a fairly straightforward evolutionary process. If the vampire's ability to reproduce depends on the human DNA of its host, that gets into a really cool, interesting co-evolution territory, basically, right? Since humans are largely evolving separately from vampires, right? Like the human genes that are being successfully reproduced are the ones that help humans survive, not the ones that help vampires survive. And so um, what's good for human fitness might not be good for vampire fitness and vice versa. That's an interesting concept. I, I don't think it's ever occurred to me that the human DNA would matter. I mean, that's one way to interpret the scene. I think it's really ambiguous whether Miriam was looking at Marcus's human DNA or his vampire DNA. I'm assuming that the human DNA doesn't completely disappear when the vampire is there just because, you know the overall cellular structure of the human doesn't crumble. That's actually a fair point. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, tons of open questions. Um, It's not super clear what's going on, but you know, this, this really gets me excited and thinking about how vampirism could function scientifically. So um, yeah, I, it may sound like I'm being super critical, but I'm actually super glad that, Deborah Harkness wrote this book and that I'm getting the chance to talk about it. Yay. I'm glad too. Yeah. Me too. So before we wrap up and get back to the episode proper, is there anything else that you would like to say about episode five? Yeah. So we don't really have to talk about this in depth now, but when you get to this part in the main episode that you're recording, I'd love to hear your take on uh, when Matthew attacks Jillian. Um, Because to me, I think there's a kind of contradiction in the way that he seems like very in control when he's attacking her like it's it's very cerebral right he's wants to bite her so he can get the psychic connection um to figure out what she was doing in the lab and like it's it's vicious but it's like a very cold viciousness that's like under his control versus the like very uncontrollable way that that both he and his mom seem to be when they're hunting and when he had that confrontation with Dana at the boathouse. Um, so yeah, I just would love to to hear your take on that. And then the other thing is, I just loved hearing Matthew talk about how awesome he thought Diana was to Hamish. It's like his admiration of her power and her bravery, I think is the perfect counterpoint for how fascinated she is with his history and intellect. Um, and so I'm just I'm really buying the romance right now. It's working for me. I'm really glad to hear that. Uh, Yeah, cool. Thanks for stopping by the lab, and I'll see you guys next week. Science aside, I love this scene. I love the song that plays, which is For You by Ray Morris. I love how they've put a blue filter on it, and Matthew's wearing blue. It's like the bluest scene in the entire series. Which says a lot, because there's so much blue in this series. And then I love all the... This this episode a lot throughout has a lot of overhead shots down onto, like, a circular thing, like the shots down onto the congregation. In this scene, we get a lot of the shots down onto, like, the beaker after he puts Diana's blood into it, the spinning Mm -hmm. thingy. Sorry, the spinning, I don't know, test tube thingy. I don't know, terms. Centrifuge. Oh, okay, yeah. I actually did know that word Probably. now that I hear it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Science. Yeah. <laughs> and I I really love all the circle imagery in, in this episode in particular, but in the, in the show in general, too. And I mm-hmm. just really love this scene. It is a beautiful scene, and the song is gorgeous. I looked up the lyrics and thought this is an absolute perfect song. They are really good at choosing songs that say exactly what they need them to say maybe almost too good like with the demons song yeah yeah sometimes it's too on the nose but sometimes it's just it's really nice and i think this one worked in the really nice especially to transition from the call Mm -hmm. into the science scene and to have him doing all of the testing and stuff for diana like he couldn't tell her he loved her but he can do this yeah Mm, yeah that's so cute (laughs) <laughs> I hadn't thought of it like that. Yeah, it's great. And then uh, Miriam comes in. Yeah, and I think this is the second time in the series that she's coming to them and like, 
Matthew, what are you doing here? Yeah, because clearly Matthew doesn't do his own science anymore. He's too big. He has underlings like Miriam for that. (laughs) Oh, if you ever called Miriam an underling to her face, I think she'd murder you. (laughs) She would murder me, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, um, I know we already talked about this scene with Anya um, and how the science of it doesn't actually make sense. But this is the information that prompts Matthew to go back to Sator to Diana. Yeah, and I get you, you clearly get the idea that he was just looking for an excuse. Mm-hmm. He's like, well, I have to tell her about this. Bye. Yep. Time to go. But let's talk about that reunion scene because it is so good. It is really good. Uh, I will say they do play the, the Witchwater song again, mm-hmm. and that's really nice to bring it all together. And then you get their hands. Their hands. Their hands, like, just touching at first, and then from this moment, we will always be one. They intertwine their fingers, and then he says it, and then they kiss, and it's wonderful, and she has to stand on her tiptoes to kiss him. Yeah. And I don't know why, but I love that. I think it's adorable. And I'm pretty sure he's on, like, a slight decline, too. (laughs) It's so good. It's it's great. Such a good line. It's... Sorry, such a good scene. It's it's the kind of scene that you expect to be the end of the episode. Yeah. But then it's not. I mean, the, the one disappointment with this scene is that he doesn't go for the butt grab, but it's fine. It probably just cut before he could get there. Probably. Probably. But then we cut from this wonderful, joyous, happy kissing to stony faced Isabeau sitting there. She knows what's just happened. She is not happy about it she has braced herself for this but then okay i just have to tell you this is my favorite scene in the whole episode Mm -hmm. which i was going to talk about in favorite section but i'll just talk about it here you know matthew basically says okay this is a thing that we have done we are not turning back but if that means we need to leave we will leave and isabeau says have i ever deserted you then why would i now you are my beloved son, and you are now my daughter. And this scene is just everything. It's really good. It's so good. Like, goosebump level good. And then doesn't she say, like, and the Claremont women, you know, protect themselves. So mm-hmm. get, I, I forget the exact words, but basically, you know, get powerful. Figure out yeah. your <laughs> She's like, fix your magic, figure it out. We take care of ourselves. Yeah. Um, but I actually, I like that because it kind of, it, it seemed a little bit like Isabel was offering help. Yeah. Uh, I meant, or at least support. Yeah. I mentioned this in the, the next scene that we have with Isabel, but I can say it here too. It's, it's like, she's still being stony and almost stoic and standoffish, but also expressing concern. Mm-hmm. And I, I like that. Yeah, absolutely. And then we go from this wonderful scene that has just given me goosebumps Back to Satu. (laughs) And she has ignored Peter Knox's advice and is seeking out Gerber to form some sort of unholy alliance with him. And Gerber consults his head in a box again and feeds it blood. And it's the most disgusting thing because there's the slurpy sound effects and I can hear them right now and I hate them so much. It grosses me out more than anything I've ever seen in in a show or anything. I hate this. No, (laughs) it's so I can't. <clears throat> oh, tell us how you really the, feel, Caitlin. <sighs> the visual of it's pretty terrible, too. I mean, because I'm sorry, I've never seen a show where you prick your finger and there's been that much blood. The, you know, the blood doesn't bother me. It's just the sound effects. The it's sound. The sound. I can't, it's so bad. I hate it. And her lips are so dry. And <sighs> yeah, it makes me wonder, though. So we've seen that a vampire taking blood from a witch or from anybody, another vampire, it, you know, gives that vampire insight into their memories. Mm-hmm. There's some kind of bond there. I wonder if vampire blood to a witch does something like that. Yeah, we don't really get any about what a vampire blood does to a non-vampire, other than, like, turning yeah. them in, in the show. We get some information in the book, but not much. Yeah, so, like, they don't really explain why he's feeding blood to the head in a box. Mm. Because he didn't do that the first time he consulted her. No. And so you don't get the sense that that's how the head in a box is sustained. It kind of felt like a treat 
because I think he threatened to not do it anymore. Sorry. I know, I know. It's terrible, but I just I want to know more about why. What does it do? Yeah. We do also then get the full prophecy from the head. And I'm very intrigued about what this prophecy could mean because it I, I I genuinely don't know. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the prophecy. Especially the way I mean, they are clearly pitting Diana and Satu against each other here because we know already that the show is setting Diana up to be the main one. And so you assume that Diana is the witch that the head is talking about. But as she's giving this prophecy, Satu is walking up and they keep cutting to the visual of Satu. Mm -hmm. And then the the head in a box says there are two or there could be two or, or something like that. And I just, I don't like it. I don't, I don't feel like there needs to be that kind of dichotomy in the story. I don't, I actually kind of like that they're setting up Satu and Diana opposite each other. I don't know that it necessarily fits in right here, but mm-hmm. I do like that they're setting that up. Okay. And then we get the scene with Isabel that I was referring to before, where she talks about how Diana has to stop behaving like some human. And as you said, get her shit together. Yeah. I mean, and Matthew has already kind of talked to her specifically about those things. Mm -hmm. But Isabeau is doing it from a perspective of she needs to learn how to take care of herself, not just use magic to make life easier. And then uh, we see Matthew and Diana talking about the results that Matthew found and that she Mm -hmm. has every genetic marker that he has ever seen in a witch. And Diana says something like... How she's never felt connected to magic like Sarah and M or even Jillian. And so she's just like, where is it all, basically, if I have it all? Matthew, I think she asks, like, why is this happening now? Mm -hmm. And Matthew says that her magic is like something that's been asleep. And now it's waking up. So it's restless, which I think is an interesting. It's an interesting way to put it. Yeah, he does that whisper thing that he does so well. And he's like, it wants to get out. (laughs) <laughs> yeah um so i it, it's like he's trying to say something without saying something yeah like i i feel like he has some suspicions about things that we may learn in future episodes and he also mentions that she has elemental markers for air and water which we've seen and he also mentions earth and then says that that means that she should be able to do spells And even though she's Mm -hmm. talked about how she's never been very good at spells previously. And I can absolutely see where that is going to be the most confusing thing for people who haven't read the books. Because it makes no sense without getting, like, a lot of magic exposition. But Mm -hmm. whatever, I guess. Yeah, they haven't done a lot of explaining how magic works in this world. Yeah. And it is definitely different than, for example, Harry Potter magic. Yeah. And then I think Matthew is about to tell her what happened with Jillian. And, you know, Diana has that iconic line of, I don't want to hear about Oxford, Matthew. Mm-hmm. And then they go upstairs and nothing really important happens there. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite line in, in the notes that you wrote. <laughs> This is a fun scene. I like this scene. I do, too. Um, you know, Matthew asks her if she's ever heard of bundling. And bundling is, gosh, it's it's an old, old practice of courtship, essentially, where uh, two people who are courting would go to bed together, fully clothed, sometimes with a board between them. And it was intended for there to be intimacy, but but not sex. Mm-hmm. And and so this is what Matthew is proposing they do here. They are not actually having penetrative sex. <laughs> but they certainly they certainly have some fun. Yes. It is a great scene. I love when there are sex scenes that end in laughter. Yeah, they're just so cute here. Like they they have fun with each other and it's not all about this. I don't know, this unrealistic, unattainable passion and desire like you see on television. You know, this is real 
you know, people laugh, people have fun, people enjoy themselves. And I think when I watched this for the first time, I started texting you, oh my God, they're laughing. It's wonderful. Yeah, you did. And I also really like, like, I like how he brings up bundling as kind of, not kind of a joke, but also something like it's that historical flirting again. You know, Mm -hmm. he's not just bringing up a random thing. He's like, oh, let's talk about history. That gets Diana hot. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And then uh, when when they're finished, she says, I don't think that's bundling. And he says, well, it is in France. (laughs) (laughs) And I feel like that's probably the most funny Matthew has been. Like, that's the actual intentional joke. That, that he's ever made. It's great. And I guess we should talk about how she examines him and all of his scars and how he's had quite quite a violent life, it looks like. Yeah, I, I do think it's interesting that Matthew becomes suddenly self-conscious when he takes his shirt yeah. off. Um, he's afraid that she's not going to like what she sees because he is scarred. I also think it's interesting that vampires can have scars in this world. Yeah, that is different. I like it. I like it a lot. Me too. And I like that we see these physical, I guess, remnants or whatever of his life. He says it's Mm -hmm. like a map. Right. Yeah, I know he he tells her about one that was from a broadsword. And so you know that one happened centuries ago and things like that. And again, it's another look into the other types of people he's been. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, I actually really like that phrasing, yeah. other types of people. Because, you know, he hasn't always been this version of Matthew, because this version of Matthew wouldn't have worked in the 17th century, in the 15th century. I find that so interesting, because, like, I can look back on myself from 10 years ago and be like, God, who was that? Well, why was mm-hmm. that? You know? Yeah. And that must be so weird to be so old and to, like, look back on who you were a thousand years ago. I don't think I would remember who I was a thousand years ago. Yeah. I don't remember who I was last week. <laughs> but, but you know, that thing where, you know, a random thing that you did when you were 10 or something will come back to your head and be like, oh, God. And you'll be, like, yeah. freaked out about it, even though, obviously, you're the only person who remembers or cares. Like, mm-hmm. that must be infinitely worse when you're 1,500 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I cannot imagine. And have probably murdered people. Yeah, there's a pretty good bet there. Anyways, sorry, I brought the fun scene down. I'll save it for favorites. Okay, carry on. (laughs) And then we switch to Domenico and Juliet in a club, which is an interesting scene. And Domenico talking to Juliet about how, about why she is the way she is. And I I like this scene. When I first saw this scene, like the first time I watched this episode, I thought Domenico genuinely kind of had a thing for Juliet. But now that I've seen the whole series, I'm like, no, he's just a manipulative shit who wants to get people to do things for him without seeming like they're doing things for him. Mm -hmm. And I really love that, like as a character thing. Yeah, I, I super hate that he tells her about Diana, though. Oh, yeah. You know, I I, I super hate that, but he's totally out for himself. I don't entirely understand his motivation other than just to bring Matthew down. I honestly think he just likes causing chaos, like just mixing stuff up. Hmm. Like We see more of it later, but I, I, I think that's what he likes to do. Just when when there's when the other vampires are worrying about Matthew or whatever is happening, then he can get whatever he wants. Yeah. Well, I guess when you're centuries old, you got to get your kick somewhere. Yeah, that's true, too. Maybe he just enjoys it. So that was a very quick scene before we cut back to Matthew's tower. And I actually, I really like this scene because Matthew is sleeping and Diana is watching him sleep. Yes. And he's like out. Oh, he is super yeah. out. But that's kind of the inverse of what we usually get in scenes like this. Usually the guy is the one who's staring at the girl sleeping Mm -hmm. and she wakes up and then she's all worried about her hair and all that stuff. And and Diana's just staring at him with a smile on her face. And I thought it was lovely. And I think this is the most non-blue color we ever see her wearing. It's like a dark purple tank top or Mm -hmm. I don't even know what it is, but I just thought that was interesting. It's super not blue. And then um, she goes for a run. 
which it's nice to see that she hasn't given up her, I don't know, I don't know where I was going with that, her <laughs> athletic pursuits that we saw earlier. And someone swoops down from the sky and grabs her, and we cut to credits. Yeah, it's like, what the heck, they can fly in the show now? Yeah, I think it's interesting uh, that previously Diana asked Matthew if vampires could fly. And Matthew said no, but neither of them mentioned that witches can. That's I mean, Diana may not have known. Diana might not have known, but I'm sure Matthew did. That's fair. Matthew does kind of seem to know everything. He just keeps it all really close to the chest. This is true. So we end on that wonderful cliffhanger of Diana being abducted from the sky. Dun, dun, dun. All in all, a pretty good episode. It is. There's so many good scenes. Mm-hmm. My, my favorite thing that happened, like, it's possibly my favorite thing in the entire series, is when Matthew's carrying her upstairs and he kisses her on the nose. And it's so adorable. Like, that affects me emotionally more than anything that happened in that bed. Aww. I love it so much. That's so sweet. It's adorable. <laughs> Honestly, I don't think I noticed it. <laughs> wow i have stunned you into speechlessness yep. i guess i have to find a new podcast partner because what oh <laughs> <laughs> you know but if we had all the same favorites then it would be boring i suppose i suppose um i already talked about isabeau's acceptance of diana into the family mm-hmm. that's that scene where she calls diana her daughter like goosebump inducing um, but I also really loved Hamish. Yes. Uh, when Hamish and Matthew were talking, because Hamish, you know, as as Matthew is just gushing about Diana and all of the things that he loves about her, which is amazing in its own right, he he stops Matthew and he says, don't think for her. Because he knows that Matthew's urge is to protect her mm. and that Matthew's urge is to just make things go away and make things easy and hamish is trying to stop that from the beginning and you don't often see that either Mm. but then on the flip side he also turns around and says if you love her then don't let anything get in the way and i just love how hopelessly romantic he is i also we didn't bring it up earlier but i mean this whole scene is fabulous but Mm -hmm. when matthew says that he's worried about her finding out about his past and hamish says i know about your past and i love you it's so good I love their friendship yeah. so much. Yeah, it's a close second, I think, for the best scene. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a close third? Close second. I'll say close second. I liked it a lot. All right, we've tried really, really hard to avoid spoilers, but not anymore. So if you have not read the books or watched all of the episodes, please proceed at your own risk. We are going to talk about things that may not have yet appeared in the show or never will. So please turn us off now if you don't want to be spoiled, and we'll talk to you next week. All right. So they've pretty much cut out the fact that, well, Marta in particular, but I think Isabeau talked about it too in the book, had an idea that Diana and Matthew could have children in the traditional human quote-unquote way, which I really don't like that they've cut it out. Like, I understand why they... Did they have that... Sorry. sorry. Did they have that inkling this early? Yeah, because Mart, she gives Diana the tea that turns out to be a contraceptive. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I do remember that. And I like that they have this foreshadowing of it in the book and that people knew or at least thought maybe it could happen because it's mm-hmm. kind of a... I don't want to say a trope. It is kind of a trope. And it's not always done well in fiction and why i didn't mind it in the books was because it wasn't a surprise yeah they set it up in the book so much better than they have done in the show i mean at this point nobody has any inkling if if you're not familiar with the story so far the story has not given you any inkling that this is possible isabeau does have the line you can never give him children which may possibly be foreshadowing but for anybody who doesn't know the story that's just a statement of fact in fact i think that makes it worse because like it's saying that nobody thinks they can have children and like that's the trope that i don't like like vampires and humans can't Mm -hmm. have children which is whatever and then oh wait this one can right it's i it worked in the book because everybody knew it could happen and they talked about it like adults yeah I absolutely agree. I think 
there's a lot more to Diana in the books than we're getting in the yeah. show. And I'm hoping that some of that gets rectified in season two. Yeah, I hope so, too. Like, they could bring it up with Philippe. Yeah, they could. Because, well, because Philippe knew. Yeah. Like, we talked about this last week, that Philippe knew that it was a possibility, and he supported certain things happening. I don't know. It's just, it. I really love the show, and I love how they've done mm-hmm. things. But I wish that there were some things they had just done better. Yeah, exactly. And just along the same similar lines, when we were talking about this in the science discussion with Anya, oh my god, it was so hard not to jump in. <laughs> oh, I know. I was sitting here like, I know Caitlin is just wringing her yep. hands. Like, she is probably biting her teeth to keep from talking right now. <laughs> and I'm, I'm interested, though, to hear, like, the continuation of that discussion when we see that they can have children. Mm-hmm. But only... Which we won't see that until season yeah. two. <sighs> anyways, but... And how it's only certain vampires with certain witches. And anyways, that's interesting, I think. Yeah. And then the prophecy about the witch who will destroy the children of the night or whatever the exact wording is. The only thing I can think that this could possibly refer to is Diana bringing about the end of, of Benjamin and all of his offspring. Because she obviously doesn't destroy all the vampires. Right. I wonder if Gerber is interpreting the prophecy that way, though. I, I mean, I'm sure he yeah. is. But yeah, I don't know. Especially since Benjamin is not even any part of the show at this point. Yeah. But like, that's... I don't remember his, like, people or whatever having a name in the books. So, I, I don't know, but that is the only possible thing I can think of this referring to. Otherwise, what is this prophecy about? Like, what? Well, I guess there are some things that even the book readers don't know. I guess that's nice. Yeah. Maybe we'll find out next season? Probably not until season yeah. three. And then in the book, Matthew does just kill Jillian in this, and or in that scene where he attacks her. And... I just wanted to bring that up because, I don't know, it's a big difference. <laughs> it is a big difference. Jillian's character is also a big difference, though. I think in the book, it didn't matter because we weren't emotionally invested in Jillian as character. That's true. And in the show, we've seen her involvement. We've seen how manipulated she's been. She's a victim of Peter Knox as much as Diana mm-hmm. is. And, and we've seen how her friendship and subsequent betrayal has affected Diana and in the book, they weren't actually friends. Yeah, she was always a terrible person. Yeah. So I think I'm glad they went that way in the show and didn't kill her. I'm glad too, but at the same time, I kind of liked in the book the idea that, that um, Diana had to come to terms with Matthew as a murderer, basically. Mm-hmm. And that she did. Yeah. I suspect that will come up eventually mm-hmm. because Matthew's going to have to kill. Yeah. It was just a, an interesting difference. And I understand why they made it. Like, they didn't actually want to make Matthew a murderer in the show. Mm-hmm. I, can, I can understand that. But just an interesting difference I wanted to bring up. But I think that's everything I had. Yeah, I don't ever remember as many of the differences as you do because I haven't reread the book in the last year or so. Right. So um, they're always really... F- they're not fresh in my head. And then you bring them up and I'm like, oh, yeah, I do remember that. And and I try, I don't want to just start Googling differences, you know, because I don't want to steal somebody else's thoughts right. on stuff. So I just try to remember what I can. Right. So we'd love to know what you think of Matthew and Diana so far. Use hashtag Desire Made Real to join our conversation on Twitter. I'm Caitlin, and you can find my other show at acommandofherown.com or find me on Twitter at Inferior Caitlin. And I am Mandy Kay, and you can find this show and all of the other Eloquent Gushing shows at eloquentgushing.com. You can find the show on Twitter at Desire Made Real, or you can send an email to desiremaderealpod at gmail.com. Or you can find just me on Twitter at Mandy Kay. Join us next week as we talk about episode six, where there's some torture. Until we meet again, remember that with every ending, there's a new beginning. Mm-hmm.